Good afternoon. Welcome to the ongoing series, The Reactive Church. Today's topic is the Industrial Revolution and how the church reacted to it. I suppose, though the term Industrial Revolution must be well known to everybody, it does help always to put it into a little bit of context. And so we're essentially talking about the years from the middle of the 18th century unto the beginning of the 20th century. Those are the primary years that we'll be dealing with today as we found a cultural convergence of the technology for transportation, the technology for mass production, and the cultural reality that populations were in great mobility moving to those centers of production. So it, this convergence of all of these three things enabled Western Europe in ways that it didn't necessarily enable the rest of the world. So we sometimes think the Industrial Revolution begins in Britain, but it is very quickly copied in France and Germany. So it's not really just a British thing, though I have to admit all the books I ever read were pretty much written by Brits. Who, so they're quite proud of their place in the Industrial Revolution. And frankly, as an Anglican, when I talk about the church's reaction, I'm going to be mostly focusing also on the Church of England and Anglicanism in general as the reaction that I know best. The highlights of the Industrial Revolution, I'm not, I'm not gonna talk too much about it because it is rather well known, but I mean, in the area of transportation, we have people like James Hargreaves, who with his spinning jenny was able to multiply uh, the ability of people to weave and to spin cloth and to weave cloth. And, and then as there was a lot of cloth, people had to try to find ways to get that cloth to markets. And so there's the simultaneous uh, development of railroads. We often give the name George Stevenson as the, the person who gets that credit. This is about 1825. And of course, it jumps hugely uh, when we get into the Henry Ford days and the uh, development of assembly lines and mass production of, of automobiles and trucks. But there is also Robert Fulton, who shouldn't be overlooked. He's an American and isn't often so, seen so uh, prominently in the European setting, but he developed that screw propeller, which enabled steam engines to drive boats. And so suddenly we were no longer trapped by the doldrums and the sails going flat, we could chug on wherever we wanted to go, delivering goods to the peoples far, far away. So part of the Industrial Revolution was the harnessing of power. Initially, water mills, windmills, but they had been around since the ancient days. Romans and Greeks had windmills and water mills. And through the Middle Ages, I mean, there were always places built on the water where there could be simple water wheels for the, for the milling of grains. But the harnessing of power escalates tremendously when we get into steam engines and uh, then eventually into internal combustion engines. This harnessing of power not only enabled great transport advances, but it also powered the factories where all the looms and the mills and the the production of mass quantities was taking place. They could finally do it now. It wasn't just hand arbite. It was indeed uh, powered by steam. Mass production, mass movement of individuals. Those factories needed people and the transport allowed them to jump on a train and come to the cities. The cities really developed in this time in ways they had never been before and consequently the villages emptied out. Farmers left their agrarian backgrounds and came to the city searching out new skills, working in factories, sometimes under miserable conditions, but they had a choice. They could be mobile now. And this was a cultural thing that we first saw with the Black Death and the, and the vacancy of the landlords and how people could escape their serfdom. We see it in multiple uh, quantities now as every major mill city, think of Manchester or Preston or Bradford or uh, Leeds, all of these places in the North, hubs of railroads, canals, steamboats, 
overseas transport, big ports and harbors, and masses and masses of people willing to work. Of course, with the urbanization of the cities, uh, not everybody came to have very good living conditions. We have the development of massive slums. We have huge problems with sanitation and with, uh, with uh, starvation. Uh, it, it was a, a difficult birth, we might say, to come into this industrial age. And there were many who suffered terribly from it. The overcrowding, the diseases which were rampant, and of course, when you have hundreds of thousands of people living on top of each other, there is a great increase in crime. It's an odd footnote of history that the, the result of the Industrial Revolution might have been the development of police departments. But the, the factories were successful in producing mass quantities, and to whom would they sell these goods? And they had to find a way to transport their goods, not just within their own nation, but abroad. And one of the factors that made the Industrial Revolution possible in England was, of course, overseas uh, commerce. Uh, having a big fleet and having colonies at the other end of the, of the boat. Uh, colonies where goods could be sold. People from England still wanted English products, English cotton, English cloth, English things, and there were boats to transport them, and they could do so in a profitable way. Developing markets not only was uh, the result of the factories, but also then fed more demand for factories and more demand for workers. And escalation, almost like a snowball rolling downhill, if Claire, I hope, doesn't mind having snow illusions when she's got so much already in her life. Towards the end of the Industrial Revolution, we see another uh, product which has been something we should not overlook, and that's how the Industrial Revolution fed both the mercantilism and the capitalism, and the opposite of that with the Marxism and the unionism. So, I mean, there, there was a lot going on in this subject we might call industrial revolution, but let's not overlook why we are gathered today, and that's to hear what the church did in reaction to it. And as I've already said, I will be mostly speaking about the Church of England because they were the first, the front, so to speak, to see and feel the, uh, the effects of the industrial revolution. It was first noticed and voiced as a concern of the church by the village priests who suddenly saw their villages being depopulated, all the young people going to town. And uh, the, the stability of the village church had provided English culture and British culture in general with a, with a real foundation where uh, the faith could be taught and it could be experienced. And uh, there was a community feeling in, in the prayer life of the congregations. But when the people left the village, they left that stability and they entered into the huge cities where they could go where they want to go or not go at all. They could find their own church or they could venture off into other sects. And so one of the reactions of the church was to decry the destabilization of the faith through the, through the development of many, many what we now call denominational opportunities. Uh, some of which we still consider to be orthodox and, and mutually beneficial, many of whom we're still friends with, some of which we have labeled as heresies. Uh, uh, these um, splits enabled uh, the church to go almost into like consumerism, where you, what kind of religion do you want? It's all available in the city. Every corner has a different kind of church. Find the one you like. You know, you could be an individualist, whereas in the village, I mean, there was the, the church. It wasn't like that in the cities. The first and maybe the most impactful of the splits from the Church of England, because of migration and workers, uh, was what we now call Methodism. The Methodist Church, a worldwide phenomenon, it's been tremendously successful. It started specifically because the stayed churches of establishment had no visitor pews, something so small. But there were all these people, maybe they had been always to church, they would show up at the closest church to their, where they're living now in the city, 
but pews were bought and paid for by families, and only they were allowed to sit in their own pew. There was no such a place for visitors. They might be sent up to the balcony, or they might just be turned away. John Wesley hated this idea, and he started a preaching tour around England, where in each city, he would say, those of you who can't get into the church, those of you who are not welcome, those of you who are not able to afford your own pew, I will be holding a service in the park, on the green, in the garden, open air. And he taught them to sing. They didn't have books. They didn't have often enough education. But he would teach them songs, hymns, beautifully written poetry, often put to already recognizable a melody, much like Martin Luther was doing earlier in Germany. But, Mar but John Wesley said they are still Church of England. They just don't have a church to attend. Charles, both as Anglican priest, never did go off with separate independent remained Anglicans until their death. Were, however, welcomed by the established church, and they did eventually give up attempting to uh, find pews for all their people. The Church of England, noticing the success of Methodism, did set about restructuring the parish system and making new churches in the cities. And often uh, benefactors and, ben and, and rich sponsors would, would build new churches specifically for workers. Uh, there is one in history uh, specifically, it's remembered as St. Savior's Church in Leeds, built as a, uh, a building specifically for the workers where they advertised free pews. Sounds very radical at that time, but to us it sounds so normal because the whole idea of paid for pews is, is completely gone by the wayside. Only in small rural areas in south, the southern part of Louisiana do you find people who say, I'm sorry, you can't sit there. That's my granddaddy's pew. I had many sermons preaching against such things. But the idea of sectarian splits developed out of this mobility of people and that they were no longer able to find a place within a stable church community. Methodism, 1790s. Mormonism, 1820s. Salvation Army broke off from the Methodists in the 1860s, Jehovah's Witnesses in the 1870s, and it goes on and on. Um, it was in 1833 that England officially became a, a, a government where non-Anglicans could take place. Prior to that time, anybody elected to parliament, anybody given a professorship at a university, anyone who even wanted to study at a university had to swear an oath and allegiance to the Church of England, the Conformity Act, it was called. But because of the social mobility, because of the destabilization and the building up of many, many different ways to worship God, uh, finally, uh, Prime Minister Peel sponsored the, the, Re Reform, the Reform Act of 1833, where the conformity oath was uh, done away with, much to the bemoaning of the bishops and the, the established church. But you can't stop the growth of faith when people are allowed to find a faith they like. And so uh, the Church of England, frankly, started looking elsewhere. And it's in this time that there is a huge growth in what we call missionary societies. The SPCK is one, the Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge, the SPG, the Society for the Propagation of Gospel in Foreign Parts, and there's the CMS, the Church Missionary Society, the ICS, and many different acronyms of British missionary societies going out into the colonies and into the world uh, to try to uh, spread the gospel. Some people have criticized that the missionary efforts of the Church of England were much more trying to spread British lifestyle. Uh, English culture. The example of uh, missionaries in Polynesia teaching the natives that they must wear wool tweed suits to come to church because that's what everyone in England did. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy thinking, 
but uh, they did not have much perspective and crazy things did happen. These missionary efforts were vastly successful in that our Anglican communion now worldwide has representatives in, I don't know, 130 countries around the world, such that the Church of England is now one of the smaller parts of the Anglican communion. The church reacted also in a compassionate way, not just in the competitive way with other religions, but in the compassionate way when dealing with slums and the, the diseased multitudes of the cities. There was the initial and the very first uh, reaction was all these people have come in and who can educate them? How can you be an Anglican if you can't read the prayer book or if you can't read the Bible? And so Sunday schools were first set up as a compassionate ministry because there were no Monday through Friday schools. Sunday schools were often the only schools that people went to and they weren't teaching crafts about Noah's Ark. They were teaching reading and writing and arithmetic. They were the development of parish schools for the, for the masses, for the lower classes. And, and, and this Sunday school movement was very, very influential. It has spread and it's still going strong in many places, but it was because of the pressure of the churches to educate the, the laboring classes that public, as we say in America, or government schools, as you might say in Britain, were first established. It had never occurred to people that everybody needed to read, everybody needed to know how to write. A second social move established by the church were what we call the training schools, training institutes. Uh, Women's Institute started this way. It's developed and still going strong in many areas. Uh, but there were training institutes also for men, teaching, carpentry, teaching basic skills, how to work with iron, how to make horseshoes, you, you name it. The church was trying to reach out and help people find new homes, new jobs, uh, that they were lacking because of the social mobility. One of the odd things, and we don't see it continuing very much, was the movement called the penitentiary movement. And I'm not talking about prison reform. I'm talking about help for fallen women uh, because the, uh, the big cities, the urbanization, the poverty did indeed probably encourage the development of this whole new industry but the church always preached against it and tried to help the women who realized this is not how the way they wanted to live. They were penitent for having done their business. They were, they were penitentials, and so they lived in a penitentiary. And this is where our word for prisons actually comes from. It starts out with this idea that the church in compassion wants to help people regain their dignity and reestablish moral lives. There were also and uh, it, they existed even into the 20th century, the idea of fresh air funds where rich people would give money so that the poor children could get out of the smug laden cities for a few days maybe, or a few weeks in the good weather to get out and clear their lungs and clear their eyes and, and uh, have a, a little bit more health because the cities with the industrial revolution were, were so toxic. The, the word smog is the combination of smoke and fog because every one of these factories with all this harness power were belching out tons and tons of, of uh, dust and smoke and chemicals into the air. Well, the church continued to react in trying to meet the needs of the working classes, but uh, the Church of England was not always as successful as it might have been. Only in one area did they succeed, and this was in the area of of establishing new ministries for the working with the poor. And uh, they actually took a German idea and copied it in the development of sisterhoods and deaconess houses. The, we think of it sometimes as reestablishing re uh, religious orders. And some of them did develop into full and complete nuns, but many of them just stopped at sisters meaning they were consecrated women working for God through the church for the good of his people. I say they stole that idea from Germany, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but it was in 1886 in Germany 
that the first deaconess house was established. And by 1880, they had 56 deaconess houses scattered around through the Lutheran churches in the Lutheran lands of Germany with over 5,600 deaconess sisters working in hospitals and schools. And uh, the British were still quite close to the Germans culturally at this time. Uh, and they uh, quickly said, what a great idea. And so in the 1830s and 40s, more so in the 50s and 60s, we see parishes starting sisterhoods, some of which still exist as religious orders now. Many of them, they did their work and then they no longer were needed and they went away. And many uh, religious orders no longer exist simply because their work was taken over by government, taken over by other institutions. They succeeded in raising the, the tone and finding ways to help the lower classes. Seminaries were also established by the church because there were so many more parishes being established. The village church having been declined, the city churches rose and they needed a special kind of priest. They needed working class men who would step up and work in the slums and in the, in, and in the working class neighborhoods. So uh, seminaries were established where you didn't have to first go to uh, Cambridge or Oxford. I mean, we still had well-educated clergy. We wanted well-educated clergy, but the new seminaries were founded and men's religious orders were also founded where, where priests could say, I don't need a big salary. I don't need a big fancy church. I will help the poor. And the poor parish slums are a great source of heroism in 19th century church history. The famous one that I like most is St. Peter's Church in London docks, which of course was about the worst possible slum that London ever had. You know, it was beset with drugs, disease, fallen women not yet penitential, crime, and uh, sailors raging with hormones traveling all through looking for wild life. St. Peter's London docks uh, became a, a shining light of a place where Christ could be preached and taught and and seen, which makes me go then to the final reaction I'm going to say, and that's that the church had to change its way of doing things. And in the middle of the 19th century, in reaction, we see the church first going through a process of looking back into history to find how can we be better serving the people, and through history, discovering a great resource box of tools to use, ancient texts, ancient poetry, ancient po uh, hymnody, ancient chants, ancient music, ancient art, ancient architecture. And there was a huge development of what we think of as neo-Gothic fashion, largely spread through the churches in the development of neo-Gothic churches. Uh, the architects, of course, we always talk about Augustus Pugin or uh, George Gilbert Scott. And in America, we like to mention the name Richard Upjohn. But there were, of course, hundreds of architects building beautiful neo-Gothic churches all over. And the irony of it is it was a reaction against the Industrial Revolution, but they were prefab churches built with mass production, industrial tiles, industrial bricks. They were uh, mass-produced churches made by factories for factory workers in the slums of the factories. It didn't affect just the architecture and the art, though almost every great stained glass window we see in England and in the continent nowadays, they're almost always Victorian glass because the old medieval glass uh, was either destroyed by Cromwell or destroyed by bombing, or it just had deteriorated with the smog eating up the leading in the windows and the windows just corroded and they were replaced by something better in the 19th century or so they thought. I mean, I'm not sure that artistically they're better, but Victorian uh, windows always look medieval and most people think they're medieval, but they're just Victorian. And you can tell if they're painted, if they have the faces painted on the glass, that's usually a sign that they've been stenciled and that there maybe were a hundred windows made identical and spread around the world in different churches. Again, this idea that mass production and easy transport and new markets all feed each other. 
The reaction, though, that I feel most personally connected to is the church against Methodism, though I'm not sure they were aware of it at the time, is taking the same idea that Wesley's had with Methodism and turning it around and using it in the established churches, and that was what we sometimes call the Anglo-Catholic revival. It's also sometimes called Puseyism by the people who didn't like it because it was much influenced by the Oxford professor uh, Pusey. And uh, they, they would make Puseyism a word that just sounded like an insult. Are you a Puseyite, they'd say. Meaning, do you follow Pusey? Well, Pusey was a mild-mannered professor of Hebrew and ancient literature. But he'd been one who actually found ancient Latin texts describing what the church was like, and he published them in English. And suddenly everybody said, that's our heritage? Where did we lose it? Where did it go? Let's bring it back. And there was a revival, our prayer book now, filled with things like the exalted at, at the Easter vigil, or the, um, a lot of the devotional poetry we have. All of these things were uh, discoveries, rediscoveries of things in the 19th century. The Anglo-Catholic revival fed into the fashion of medievalism, ability to build new buildings with metal and factory bricks, uh, the, the archival discoveries, and the uh, pastoral care in the slums. And it reached its high point probably in the 1920s, 1930s, when it looked like the Anglo-Catholic Church may well take over England completely. But there has been, since World War II, a resurgence of the evangelical wing and so that we have in England right now very much divided uh, churchmanship along the traditional description, low church, high church, or broad church. And I'm not sure what uh, Church of the Ascension is. I think we have a little bit of everything here, which I think is what the church should probably always be, inclusive and welcoming of people with traditions. 